got a little, few little war stories and simple tips I'm going to point out a little bit. And it kind of, it's a scatter shot all over the place. And I'm going to try to get through with this pretty quick. So y'all work your way through it with me. And I hope you get something out of it. You know, checking for water pump action and coolant flow, I used to take this clear hose and put between the, you know, unhook from the heater core and put clear hose so that I could watch the coolant circulate. <clears throat> and if you've got a, an impeller that's a steel one that had rusted away, or if the reaction surface, uh, whether it's in the timing cover or part of the water pump, has cavitated, you may have a less than efficient water pump where you don't have a whole lot of coolant flow. There was a Taurus that we worked on one time and the girl came in and the only complaint she had was that she didn't have any heat. And so I said, okay, so we'll go ahead and, uh, you know, make sure that or the blend door was working okay. So I took these, this, uh, you can buy this hose here typically from Ace Hardware and, uh, you know, just get the right size hose where you can kind of shove it inside the heater hose deep enough where it won't pop out when you start it up. When you crank it up, you ought to see coolant circulating through that clear hose. And that is a really handy tool. Doesn't cost hardly anything to do. It's a little aggravating sometimes to get the uh, heater uh, hoses loose. But what you got to do is come up with a way you can put something clear in there. And on different, you know, some of them have got those hard, quick disconnect fittings. And you got to work with that too. So anyway, point is, that impeller, <clears throat> if it rots away, and it's not close enough to the reaction surface, you're not going to have a water pump that works like it's supposed to. Now, the impeller blades, like this is one of those steel impeller uh, blades, and the reaction surface that it spins next to, it's got to be a certain distance from that. Some of you might remember that story I told about that water pump I replaced on a Dodge Dart, I think it was back in 1984, when I was working at the Lincoln Mercury dealership. It belonged to the bookkeeper and so the water pump was leaking and so I got a water pump from the parts house where they ordered me one from up front and I cleaned everything up put it on there burped it out and all that he came back the next day and he said his temperature gauge was running up in the middle instead of down on close to the bottom which is he wanted it to run really cool which he didn't realize it's not, not as good from for the engine as one that's running a little warmer but he didn't like that. He wasn't going to accept that. He wasn't going to put up with it. And I said, okay, well, fine. Let me see what I can do. The only thing I had done was put the water pump on it. So I pulled the water pump off. I looked at it, and I visually I didn't see anything wrong. But I said, have them bring me another one of these water pumps. So the same part house brought us another water pump that was the same brand. And you might notice this impeller here is, is pressed onto this shaft right here. And what they had done when they built that water pump was when they pressed the impeller on, they didn't press it on far enough. And when I measured the clearance between the impeller blades and the reaction surface, it was about 20 thousandths of an inch, as I remember. You know, 1984 was a long time ago. <clears throat> it was about 20 thousandths of an inch uh, on the new pump. But on the old pump, it was nearly 70 thousandths. But if you just glanced at it and held it in your hand, you wouldn't think anything about it. And so I went ahead and uh, replaced the water pump with another water pump, with the water pump that had the tighter clearance, and the vehicle ran cool again like it did. So that was a day that I learned something that I used for years working in the field. You know, you learn, if you, if you can learn and file away certain things like that, that are little important little principles that you never would have thought about otherwise. See, if I had always popped every water pump on there and everything worked like it was supposed to, you know, I wouldn't have had that frame of reference <clears throat> for the stuff that I found later. Now, <clears throat> occasionally, excuse me for clearing my throat, you know how that works, can't help it sometimes. This right here was a, a, actually a 2.8, but there were several little in this generations of this engine that GMs that had these, the timing cover. Uh, contained the water pump reaction surface and that's where the water pump went and the pulley uh, was driven by the back of the belt and it rides really close to this uh, cover. Okay, so you might notice on this one here the impeller is cast iron which is really unusual. Usually it's stamped steel. Some, a lot of times it'll be plastic these days. It may be aluminum but this one here was was cast iron and boy was it heavy. Uh, and so the, the deal was, it came in there squeaking 
with that pulley squeaking against the water pump. It wasn't leaking or anything, but he was listening to a squeak. So we put the water pump on it because we saw the bearings had failed in the water pump. After that, it ran hot, but it wasn't running hot before. Well, what had happened was this cast iron impeller, and I, I, this is actually the timing cover off of that vehicle, this ca and I put the, a, a good water pump on it so you can see, when we put a good water pump on it, we had too much clearance right here. Okay, so <clears throat> that's why this thing started overheating. Now, this timing cover here, we got off of another engine that we had sitting over there that was a junk engine, but the timing cover in reaction service was good. We replaced the guy's timing cover. This one here, you can see how it was, this uh, cast iron impeller when the bearings failed machined material away, and it increased when you put a new water pump on there with good bearings in there, it just had too much space in there. And it would not, I mean, it kept making air and bubbling, and I was thinking, man, what's going on here? And then I remembered that situation from the early 80s whenever that water pump had done what it done. When I got to looking, see, this right here, if you just looked at it, you wouldn't think there was anything wrong with it. But whenever I compared it to that other new one, you can see this one was beautifully machined to match the impeller and all. This one here had been ground away. <laughs> I even measured it with a mic, but I don't know how accurate that was. But the simple fact was we put a timing cover on it, put the water pump back on, burped it out, you know, got the air out of it with the little bleeders and all that, and everything was in good shape. All right, it's good to have a TPS, TPMS tool on hand. Uh, but we had this uh, lady that it seemed to me like, have you ever had a customer that seems like every time you do anything, no matter how hard you try, something blows up in your face? <clears throat> she brought her vehicle over, and she says uh, she had a flat. And, you know, I didn't really like putting a plug in a tire if we had time to break it down and go ahead and put a patch on the inside. And so it was a little small GM car of some kind. I can't remember what it was. It was one that had TPMS on it, though. And she says, don't mess up my vehicle and, 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 and all that. Make sure that all my tire pressure monitor stuff works. And all that. I said, yeah, yes, ma'am, we'll do that. And so I had shown the students how you can break the tire down. And, you know, these with the rubber stem on them, they're aggravating because you can't just take those out and let them fall into the tire like you can the ones that's got the little uh, nut on them. So I went ahead and I said, you gotta, you got to make sure, and I showed them firsthand, you got to have start out with this tire pressure monitor sensor here. And when you put it back on, you got to have it there. I've actually done another video on that. But we did that thing just exactly right. We never touched that sensor. We put it, you know, put the tire back on there, aired it up. The sensor was didn't have a scratch on it. Everything was just like it's supposed to be, or so we thought. Um, and so put it back on there, aired up and balanced and all that kind of stuff. And this thing had a tire pressure monitor light. Doggone it! Well, I went back around with my tire pressure monitor tool, and every one of the sensors except that one would read. And I said, I can't believe this. I said, I, and I was scrambling because this lady's got to have her car at lunch. And she's not going to take kindly to me, you know, keeping her there longer. And so I said, well, I'm going to have to send over to the parts store and get another sensor. So I sent over, I said, send me a sensor for this particular car. So they sent me one. It wasn't the Delco. It was in some other brand. And so we carefully put it on there. And we did the thing, all, you know, we did just like we were supposed to. Put the thing in there, mounted it just right and all that. Aired the tire up to the correct pressure. Uh, put it on the car, use this tire pressure monitor tool, which is a good one here, it's kind of pricey, but it's a good one. And whenever we activated it, this screen said that it was activated, but the tire pressure monitor system, even though we tried to get it to recognize all the sensors and retrain them and all that, it would not accept whatever this sensor was transmitting in spite of the fact that it was the the proper frequency and everything else. It was just, and I had run into that a long time ago on a mass airflow sensor that I bought from the parts store for a GM car. It was one of those white box sensors, you know, that comes from China or somewhere. You could measure the frequency of that sensor and it was perfect and everything seemed like it was doing just fine, but that check engine light would not go off until I put a Delco sensor on that car because it just didn't like that sensor. And we had a similar situation to this. And this lady had to have this vehicle. We didn't have time to change the sensor again. And whenever she came to pick it up, I tried to explain to her what happened. But, you know, nothing you say is going to satisfy her. She was mad at us from then on about that. But, you know, sometimes you're better off if, if some of the customers carry their stuff somewhere else. But I would have been more than glad to do whatever we needed to do to fix this. But she just needed the car. No, I'm taking it right now, blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. 
Now this is a mistake that derails the service. This one student was working on this, and this wasn't exactly the, the banjo bolt, because it was the one with a half inch, uh, you know, fine thread banjo bolt on some kind of an old dodge. And whenever he was putting the, the brake caliper back on there, uh, he over torqued this hollow bolt, which is real easy to do, and it popped off. He broke the doggone thing. And so I called the parts store frantically looking for another boat. They didn't have one. They had to order one. And I wasn't going to take a drill press and make one because you don't ever know where that's going to go. And so they went ahead and ordered me one. And this, this vehicle was supposed to be in and out of there in a couple of hours. And it wound up having to wait until the next day for a caliper uh, banjo bolt. Because, the, and, I, and I, after that, and you learn from this, and whenever I had students that were getting ready to do a brake job, you know, they'd been trained and all, I said, do not under torque or over torque this banjo bolt because if you under torque it it'll leak if you over torque it you're going to break it if you over torque it and almost break it you got a really serious situation because it could just turn loose all at once and you lose your brakes and i said so make doggone sure that you pay really close attention to the torque whenever they could i'd have them go to all that and find out what the torque specs for it were and torque it with a little small torque wrench you know i also had to teach some of the other students that whenever you're working with a six millimeter bolt with a 10 millimeter or an eight millimeter head on it, you don't need to use a half inch drive ratchet to do that because you, and, and one of them says, why not? It's still tightening the bolt. Yeah, but you don't have any feel for how tight you're getting and you'll break the doggone thing off. And then you got people that would use a good strong air ratchet and spin a six millimeter bolt up on a water pump and snap it off. You know, there's all kinds of stuff went on like that. And uh, I taught, you know, some automotive instructors wouldn't let their students do um, any kind of work with air tools at all. But I typically wanted them to know how to use air tools because air tools are how you make money whenever you're working in the real world. So they needed to learn that. Okay, so the over torque the banjo bolt. See, I waited. I actually set that up wrong. I meant to have it pop up automatically, uh, but there was no volts available not that day anyway. However. It pays to be prepared. You can get these kits. It's got all these different bolts in them, all these different banjo bolts, and all these different copper washers and all that. We, I, I had a, these little kits don't cost all that much, and you can get them on Amazon, or the parts store may have them. But they tend to get either picked over, or they wind up having everything but the bolt you need sometimes. Uh, like, for instance, we had one of these kits right here, and we would... It seemed like the same size copper washer was what we always needed out of that kit. And we wound up with a bunch of holes full of washers that we never needed and one empty hole of the one we used all the time. Of course, if we just got a bag of them, we'd wind up needing some other size. So you know how that goes. But they do make kits for this. They also make bleeder screw uh, kits. Sometimes, you know, you got to replace the bleeder screw for whatever reason. If you don't want to have to replace the whole caliper and re uh, bleeder screws rounded off or damaged or something like that. But anyway, these little kits are good. Other kits you can get that are really handy to have, uh, and you can get these from Amazon too, are these kits that come with all of the little um, door panel fasteners, you know, the little Christmas tree plastic things you put in there, or the little fender liner uh, uh, fasteners and all that you snap up in there. If you can get you a, an assortment of those, you'll be really happy with that. I had an assortment of air conditioner fittings and and paraphernalia and stuff that I paid like $144 for. They had four different drawers with a whole bunch of different compartments. And there was all kinds of stuff that was really handy to have. It even have, had various different color orifice tubes in it and all that kind of thing. And it's good to have those kits on hand. But when you use the items out of one particular drawer or compartment in there, make sure you get that part number and have the part store send you some to replace it so your kit is always stocked. That's just intelligent to do that. Now, the parts department at the Ford place used to run out of stuff that we were having to replace all the time, and I don't know why they would let themselves run out. That was always annoying to me. <clears throat> These are transmission stuff. I've seen full transmission fluid exchanges fix vehicles. A 2004 Mercedes E320. Now, the president of the college came, and his wife had one of those. It was supposed to have lifetime fluid. So I told him to get the kind of fluid it took, and I made some adapters and we did the full fluid exchange and then we followed up and did a fluid and filter change to make sure everything was copacetic and took care of that problem. Now this uh, 2005 Cadillac came in there and it had brake fluid, I mean it had transmission fluid and that thing looked like brake fluid. 
and they wasn't shifting right. And so we did a full fluid exchange on that one and fixed that one. That's all we had to do. Now, like I say, when I say full fluid exchange, if we're doing a full fluid exchange and it's got a pan you can take off and a filter you can change, I do the fluid exchange first and then I follow up and I do a regular transmission service. Now, it takes quite a bit of fluid to do this and it can be fairly pricey, but it doesn't cost as much as rebuilding a transmission. Uh, there was a Jeep Grand Cherokee I talked about that had a harsh downshift issue caused by a TP sensor. You know, whenever you first turn on the key, the engine controller grabs whatever TP sensor voltage it sees as closed throttle. It, it's depending on you not fooling with the gas pedal while you're um, starting it up. All right, after that, it sees closed throttle as being, what, 0.88 volts. And this one here, uh, a lot of the times would come back to closed throttle, but sometimes whenever you were coming back down, it would stop on 1.35 volts, and that would confuse it in its downshift algorithms, and it would make it, you know, downshift hard or wait too late to downshift, and then it would slam whenever it had to go by the vehicle speed sensor. I mean, there's just all kinds of stuff going on there. Well, once this GM car came in with a stalling at a stop sign concern, and it turned out the torque converter was remaining locked. I could feel that whenever you pulled up, it would boom, like it, you know, like you had a, a a manual shift car in fourth gear or something, and you just stop without mashing the clutch. And so I I went ahead. And I said, well, we're not doing transmissions this semester, but we'll go ahead and do your transmission service and add some sea foam. You know, I'd already checked the electrical part of it to see if maybe something was keeping it locked, but there wasn't. And so we, we put sea foam in there and we did the uh, transmission service and she never had that problem again. You know, there was another girl that came in with a Santa Fe that had a hard shift that would jerk a crick in your neck. And it was, I noticed when I rode it with her looking at the scan tool she was driving, I would see it jump from second to fourth gear. And uh, she said she could play with the throttle and it would be okay. Uh, and I said, well, that tells me there's something going on with the uh, software. And so I noticed on the scan tool, it was one of those old gray Autel ones. I've still got one of those things. Uh, back in the day, it cost about 1500 bucks, but now you can get one for nearly nothing from Amazon. And uh, I think it's a DS708 or something like that. But anyway, I've, like I said, I still got one, but I don't remember the number on it. And I saw that it, it gave me a choice for resetting the transmission adaptive learning tables in that Santa Fe. So I did that. Stop, switch off the car, turn it back on with just key on engine off. Reset the transmission and learning table. Are you sure you want to do this? Yes. She drives it. She can't get it to hard shift after that at all. She said, well, now I've got $1,600 I saved for a transmission that I can use for something else. Uh, so this 2000 Malibu I talked about a while back came in and drove like the catalytic converter was clogged. And it had a 3T40. Now, she had spent a couple of thousand dollars on it trying to get somebody to fix it. Somebody had added fluid, you know, it's, it's got that little red cap you take off and pour fluid in there and then down on the bottom with the transmission at the right temperature, you're supposed to pull that little plug out and see if it drips out of there and poke your screwdriver in there, you know, and they didn't do that. They poured fluid in there and had too much in there. And I don't know why that thing didn't push fluid out the vent, but on that particular transmission, it basically will make the car hunker down and you'd swear the catalytic converter was stopped up. Uh, my son's car, after that, he was driving a car that had the same kind of transmission in it, and I think it was a 99 Malibu or something. Uh, and he was driving that thing, and it, uh, he went to get the oil changed on it. He used, you know, used to work at a tire store, but he'd just go pay to get his oil changed because he's got the money. So they changed the oil, and after it left the tire store, it ran like it didn't have any power. So he calls me, he says, Dad, what you think is going on with this? I said, I'm going to tell you what you need to do. Take it home to your uh, little shop you got there at the back at home. And I told him how to check the transmission fluid. And just like on this one here, whenever he had that thing that warmed up like you're supposed to check the fluid with the engine running, he pulled that plug out and about two quarters ran out of there. That's the same way I found this one. After I let the transmission fluid out and put that plug back in, drove it again, it ran like a normal car. He had the same experience. He drained that extra fluid they had poured in there out and then whenever he drove it it ran, ran normally and I don't know why they added fluid he didn't have a leak they hadn't checked it they obviously didn't know how to check it but why did they pour transmission fluid in it I don't know but anyway every transmission won't do that though just those little front wheel drive GMs there may be some other ones I don't know about that do it though Thomas Edison believed in the electric vehicle he had an electric car he put together in 1913 and if you look at his ride, it was a pretty nice looking car with, a, with nice comfortable seats and all that. Had a big battery uh, array up there in the front, you know, lead acid batteries. It was, 
he was all about DC voltage anyway. And uh, so he built that car. But Ford made a battery-powered Ranger that was Ford's first all-electric production vehicle. And from 1998 to 2002, they made it. And it cost about $53,000. And they built it on an Explorer chassis, and they used lead-acid batteries that was basically underneath the surface of the bed in the rear. And most of them were leased for fleet use by cities. And as there were some farmers that leased them too, but they all, they wanted them all back. They wouldn't let you buy the thing and keep it. They wanted to let, you know, I think they charge $155 a month for you to lease it. But at the end of the lease period, you didn't have the option to buy it. They wanted it back. But a replacement battery for one of these things, we stumbled across it when I was at the Ford place. We stumbled across for these electric vehicles. The battery was $18,000 if you had to have battery for it. Or it may have just been a set of batteries. I don't know how it was put together. But they did have, Ford did have an electric pickup truck uh, that, you know, plug-in electric that they built back from four years. This mid-80s Chevy celebrity was not interesting enough to rescue. Uh, about, I took this picture about 15 years ago, or maybe 20. It was sitting at a house around the corner from where I live. Um, and it just kept sinking into the dirt. I mean, you could tell it had been here a long time with all that grungy green stuff on it and everything. Well, nobody's going to say, man, I'd love to have that car. I want to fix that up and drive it, you know, said nobody ever. Nobody's going to do that. But uh, furthermore, what a lot of people don't realize is when these fuel-injected cars are parked, the fuel pump gets ruined by the rotten gasoline, and the fuel lines are all clogged up with crud. And, I mean, you just got to make all kinds of, uh, if it's been sitting for very long, you're going to have a lot of trouble getting it back in the wind. Now, we've actually taken some on, like this when I was at Automotive, and it's a big job getting them things. For some strange reason, back in the day, though, you could have a car sitting there three or four years that hadn't even been started with it. That was a, uh, a you know, carbureted gas burning 53 Ford or whatever. And you could push that thing, and it would fire up and run. <laughs> so, the, you know, the, they were a lot more resilient back then, or the gas was different or something. Mid-80s Chevy Celebrity, though, the one that I fixed back in the 90s, uh, belonged to a local company, beverage company, and they said it stalls when we're stopping at light, so when they hit the gas, I mean hit the brake, it would die. And so I was thinking, that's really interesting, you know, and I noticed not only did it stall when I stopped, but I could put it in reverse and back up, and I put a fuel pressure gauge on it, and whenever you would hit the brake, the fuel pressure would drop to zero long enough that it would kill the engine and it would do the same thing backing up. And I said, this has got something to do with gas sloshing around in the tank or something. You know, you're basically just gathering that little piece of data. You know, you can, rather than go and looking for electronic problems, let's look for something that's simpler than that. Well, this is what was going on. Whenever, this is, this is a, I illustrated this, and this is not exactly what the gas tank looked like, but it's a reasonable facsimile. Uh, if you move forward with the sock in place, uh, you know, you had about a quarter of a tank, and this one right here. Well, when they got a little bit low on gas, and they were moving forward or sitting still, this gas was heavy enough to where it would all can the bottom. You notice how that it's all it all cans the bottom, and there's some space between the with this sock floating around in there. The bottom of this fuel pump was actually had some space between it and the bottom of the tank, which usually the sock would force it to have space and provide you know, so that it could actually get fuel. They put the sock right on the bottom of the tank to deal with any water that might gather in there. That's kind of where they, before they spring-loaded them. This one wasn't spring-loaded. It was just a, you know, a pipe going down in there. Well, if you stopped or you backed up, the bottom, the, the weight of the gasoline would shift to the end of the tank, and the tank would pop up, boom, like that, and it would stop up the bottom of the pump. And when it stopped up the bottom of the pump, the fuel pressure would go. It happened going forward and you know, if you stopped going forward or if you just accelerated going backwards. And somebody had put a fuel pump in there, and you know how when you're having a fight to get those things through the hole, and that uh, sock just kind of shoves on the bottom of there anyway with that little, with those little barbs and that little metal shell. And uh, it was real easy, and I don't know how many times I was putting a pump in there, and that would come off, and I would always pull it back out and stick a sock back on it. Well, somebody either didn't notice that they dropped the sock or just said, I'm not going to worry with that, and they just let it fall off because they didn't think it really mattered. The problem with not having a sock on it or if the sock gets breached is any little particle of anything going through that positive displacement pump can go through that impeller, I mean, that thing, and lock it up. It'll just stop the pump from turning. 
And so that can basically kill a fuel pump. That fuel has got to be filtered through that sock before it goes to the pump. It's a really bad bet to have that thing in there with no sock on it. So I think that's part of the reason the sock is there is to keep solid particles from getting up in there and locking up that positive displacement pump. See, the water pump is not a positive displacement pump. It has an impeller spending extra reaction service. But on this one here, for every turn of that pump, you're going to be putting fuel somewhere. You know. All right. These old tough hard bodies, I, we worked on uh, one of these not long after I went to work at the college. And I wasn't really familiar with this transmission, but I was familiar enough to know that she had wiped out these turbine splines. I mean, when you look down in that thing, you know, we had to drain the fluid out of it. You look down in there, there was not a single one of those splines still there. Now, if somebody been overworking the transmission, pulling it too hard, you know, this turbine is actually driven. This is driven by the engine, right? And this throws fluid. You know, there's your stator in the middle. It's got a one-way clutch in the middle of it. Well, it throws fluid against this turbine shaft, and until you spin this thing faster and put up enough pressure so you can force this to turn. See, this turbine shaft goes into the transmission. And so, the, except it's going out the other side, I do it pointing the wrong way, but the transmission is back this way. All right, so they wiped out the splines. Okay, and so we went ahead and put the, uh, I took the aqueous parts washer, and our, I can't remember if it was the aqueous or the one with the benzene. We had safety clean parts washers and we've had both kinds at that at the school but I put a paint strainer and, and over a drain pan so that whenever you would I just ran a parts washer all night long with it running through that uh, transmission cooler and I managed to catch a bunch of stuff here in this uh, paint strainer I had a paint strainer there paint strainer is pretty good for that kind of thing and I kept a big old box of them for that purpose and I said, okay, I've got enough of that out of there where it'll be okay. Well, the problem was I didn't get enough of it out of there because there's always some of it hanging around. So your best bet is to replace the radiator or the transmission cooler, blow those lines out, clean them out really good, flush them out really, really good before you ever hook them back up. And then when you put that thing back together, if you don't, you're going to have metal particles going to get in there and they'll get past the filter typically and they'll stick valves in the valve body. And my guys had to take his valve body apart and clean it you know, about a dozen times before they ever finally worked all that garbage out of there. It, it would shift normally and then it would stop working right and there'd be stuck valves and there would be, you know, little pet particles of junk in there. Well, one time they were in such a hurry putting it back together that you see this right here, there's a little place on this separator plate where the ball is supposed to roll back and forth. They accidentally, they got used to doing it so fast they weren't paying attention and they put a ball in both holes instead of putting just one ball so it could roll this so it could shuttle back and forth and that was downright funny but uh, what they did was when they after got it all put back together with a ball in each one of them holes when it shifted into second gear it locked up the wheels <laughs> I mean it was I guess it was in two gears at once that was just plum funny you learn stuff that way I bought a truck like this one here except it was a different color and I bought it for uh, $500 back in the early 1990s. It was white, same year model as this. It was a barn truck, ran good. I drove it for a while and sold it for $750. All I had to do with it the whole time I had it was replace the turn signal switch, which is a little aggravating if you hadn't done one of those. You hadn't, hadn't really had a good time. So, you know, the turn signal switch came with the, uh, didn't come with a connector on it. You were supposed to use the existing connector, which is that curved thing feed all those wires down through there and then snap them into the uh, right cavities on that thing. You, know, you had to really know something to do that. But anyhow, uh, I had done a lot of those whenever I was working at the dealer, so I wasn't uncomfortable with it. One time I was working on a truck like this. This is a scary story. Maybe you like scary stories? And um, I was kind of new at the Ford place. And, you know, I was thinking, well, if you've got... Uh, a situation that where you're having to check like for example it was a truck almost just like it's so maybe in a year or two newer they said the backup lights didn't work and I says well what I'll do there was a connector back at the back of the engine compartment and I had to climb up in there with my rear end stuck up in the air to reach down in there to get to it and I disconnected I said I'm gonna turn on the key I'm gonna bypass the um, you know act like the little wire here I'm gonna make the switch you know and just plug this on here 
In other words, bypass the two terminals that are going to the backup light part of the switch. Of course, the neutral safety switch is in that same switch, you know. And I said, I'm going to see if the backup lights will come on this way. And I'm up here in this truck with the hood up. And I go to bypass those two wires. Now, you got to remember there's power coming to that thing because the key's on and the backup lights have got to send that power back to the backup lights. That's my, that was my thought. But what happened was, and it seems to me like, if I'm not mistaken, our, the thing was in reverse. I never did put it in park. Had to have been. And whenever I'm, I accidentally shorted against the starter wire and the engine started, and I was under the hood and the truck started backing up. <laughs> <laughs> and the transmission mechanic ran over and grabbed the coil wire and snatched it off to stop the truck. <laughs> but I was thinking, boy, sometimes we can make some of the stupidest mistakes. You know, you don't realize until you're in this, you know, just how much of an issue it is. I mean, that, that was one that I, uh, you know, fortunately I didn't crash or nothing, but it very well could have happened. And I'm always thankful to that transmission mechanic for grabbing that coil wire when he realized he acted pretty quick. Because that thing was moving and I was under the hood. There was nothing I could do about it at the time. This right here is Ace Misfire Detective. And it measures exhaust pulses to find a misfire. It's really pricey, but it doesn't work all that well. And I know they may get mad at me for saying this. But if you look online, there's a lot of people that complain about this. One of the problems I had was, you know, what you had to do was you hooked your little first look sensor, which is a pulse sensor, into the exhaust. And you know how if you've... I worked on misfires, the exhaust goes puff, 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 puff. And their strategy here was to take the to, to get a trigger reading from the number one spark plug. Tell it what vehicle it was. You notice this one here was a Chrysler 3.7, it was a Dodge pickup, basically. 165432 was the firing order, just like a 4.3 Chevy V6. And so I, I hooked everything up and it gives you this pattern and then it's supposed to light up the misfiring cylinders a different color cylinder or cylinders and one of the things that I didn't like about this see it, it gives you all kinds of information supposedly and see and it gives you this right here too you know she says persistent misfires detected and this is a little graphic where it supposedly tells you which ones are skipping and you know it'll vacuum needle condition it'll tell you whether it's you know whatever I think you're supposed to give it this information here but the point is Every time you run the test again, you hit start again, it finishes the test, it gives you results. Every time you hit it, it might give you a different cylinder. And I never really, I mean, it, in theory, this is a really good way to do this. There was a lot of other stuff that the misfire detective would do that was pretty cool. But this particular task that I got it for, and I think it cost $1,200 when I got it. There's a, a special little green dongle you had to plug in that was like a software key and all that. But anyway, uh, I, I had this. I used it. I really didn't care for it, with all due respect to the Ace Misfire Detective folks. You have to have a Pico scope in order to you to do this, though. You can't do this with just any other scope. It's got to be a Pico scope. All right, this is all I got. Uh, we'll be back next week. And hey, let's all be careful out there. Uh, thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you next time.